All right. Good morning, Doug. Uh, I'd like to, we have questions from members of the file today. And the first one has to do with a very, very good article that you published in International Man this week. I'll link to it in the description of the video. I encourage everybody to go check it out and sign up for their list to get these articles regularly. But the question is, could Doug paint a picture of the sci-fi dystopia he's speaking of in this article with regards to the combination of guerrilla warfare and manotech? He says, I'm having trouble picturing what that looks like, especially for the uh, purpose of trying to understand what the risk landscape would look like for non-combatants. Maybe you can explain the article and then answer the question. Yeah. So this was uh, in internationalman.com, I, I guess it was on Thursday. Um, it was a kind of stream of consciousness uh, on my part of uh, what's going to happen on the war front uh, in the years to come. Guerrilla war, uh, war against uh, Islam, uh, nanotechnology as an ultimate technology that uh, all these technologies start out at the top, uh, controlled by the state, and then quickly filter down to the common man who then uses them to liberate himself. And um, so that's kind of it. It's uh, like I said, it's a stream of consciousness article, so I cover a lot of things. But um, nanotech, uh, I think that's going to be the ultimate evolution of just about everything. And if people have, aren't familiar or have forgotten about nanotech, it's a concept that I first discovered uh, when I read a book by Eric Deck Drexler called Engines of Creation. And uh, Drexler came to an early uh, era society meeting in Aspen also. I got to spend a lot of time and talk to him, uh, modern. He, did he actually coin the phrase nanotech? I'm not sure, but it's possible. Anyway, what is nanotech? It's um, the uh, creation of molecular size or atomic size, really, because molecules can be quite large. Uh, uh, creation of two things. One, uh, assemblers that are little machines that can pick up individual atoms and put them where you want. And supercomputers, submicroscopic computers, submicroscopic, all this stuff is submicroscopic nanotech. It's a millionth of a meter type stuff. Uh, so the supercomputers control the tiny assemblers and it's actually pixie dust. So if you, uh, through a um, through a handful of assemblers and um, supercomputers onto a table, just a wooden table, uh, they'd be, in theory, completely capable of disassembling the table into its, all of its component atoms, well, maybe 92 of them might exist, and reassembling them into anything that you could possibly imagine. So it's it's magic, actually. It's like uh, it's like um, well, what do we call the machines that construct things line by line now? Oh, um, oh, you mean assembly line? No, no, no. Three D printers. Oh 3D yeah, printers. yes. It's like a three D printer, except to the nth degree, where it's not just a big clunky printer creating something like this. It's it's pixie dust is what it is. Mm -hmm. So question is, at what point will that filter down to the average guy uh, out of the, uh, the labs of, uh, of uh, Defense Department Advanced Projects divisions and filter down to the average guy? Well, it'll happen eventually, I suspect. Does it, does it exist now? At that, I mean, does, do these things actually exist today? Well, kind of, because, um, I mean, it was 30 years ago already that uh, IBM uh, took, using a, a scanning, tunneling electron microscope, um, was able to manipulate individual atoms and spell out the words, the letters, IBM, very clearly. Uh, uh, let's see, what kind of... They use one type of atom for to spell off the letters and a different type of atom 
to spell the letters as the paper, yeah, as it were. So yeah, this was 30 years ago. So there's been a lot of progress uh, uh, made since then. And how do you keep up with that? Because there's so much progress in so many different ways. And I'm certainly behind as to where matter, nanotech is, where it's going currently. But uh, I should catch up because I was an early adapter of it. I remember I gave a uh, speech in Aspen uh, about 30 years ago uh, to uh, a bunch of uh, rich Aspen investors. Uh, so they invited me and another friend of mine, uh, an Aspenite, to give a speech. Uh, and uh, I introduced the concept of nanotech to these guys. These were all right, rich guys. None of them had even heard of the word. Mm -hmm. So I still think that's the big deal. But listen, in between now and nanotech, uh, we're going to have, uh, with guerrilla groups of God knows what type, any type and every type you can imagine, uh, they're going to do cyber warfare, which is pretty easy. You can, if you're computer competent, you can do all kinds of damages. They're constantly proving. And bio warfare with uh, home home bio labs creating all, well, you can be Dr. Fauci if you would, except much more malevolent even than him. Hmm. Well, we, we definitely see the effect of this technology in terms of drones. I mean, you know, we, we, you, can, you can see that it was coming, you know, five years ago, but they've in, in uh, both in Ukraine and in uh, Palestine and Israel now, the use of drones is shocking. And even the, the Houthis, you know, uh, attacking these uh, cargo ships now with drones. Yeah, and these things were basically just battery to battery driven toys. It's really what, and, and but they've evolved very quickly so that they're reaching optimal size for delivery of small weapons against individual soldiers. Of course, the next step along the line is going to be uh, bumblebee sized drones. <laughs> but, you know, since computer chips are so powerful and so small, can zero in on individual soldiers. And if you're attacked by a dozen deadly, deadly bumblebees that are mechanical, not real bumblebees, but maybe they will be real bumblebees. They'll integrate and bio with, wow. you, know, you know, that, that soldier that gets attacked is in a world of trouble. So, yeah, and, and I mean, that, those DARPA projects have been out in the public for a while where they have these incredibly small drones and that are even able to power themselves by landing on like an electrical line you know, in the, in the public to basically, to, to provide them with a, a, you know, a supply of energy. So this stuff has been out there for a while and it's public. So I uh, want, yeah, it's definitely coming, no doubt. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it just depends how, um, how hardworking and how focused, uh, the bad guys want to get towards an individual project and how they want to use it. But actually what will happen, uh, first is, uh, if things get out of control, I mean, the U S itself is one gigantic soft target, everything from electrical substations, which there are thousands and thousands in the U S like somebody that plans out and attacks all those substations would bring down the whole grid, uh, in a way, I mean, you need, you know, you need hundreds or maybe a few thousand, uh, you know, uh, aggressive young males to go out and do the things that you do to destroy a substation, which wouldn't be hard to do actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you wouldn't be able to build them all back up in any reasonable period of time. The grid would come down, everything would cascade from there. And maybe you couldn't build them back at that point because you can't pump gas when the electricity isn't working and on and on. And if you have any kind of imagination at all, I mean, you could scare yourself half to death in just 15 minutes of thinking how you would do it. If you wanted to uh, create chaos in a soft target like the U.S., and I'm of the opinion that anything that can happen eventually will happen. It's just the law of large numbers. I, I told you yesterday about a, a new movie that came out on Netflix. It's uh, called "Leave the World Behind," and I read the book earlier this year. And the movie, when the movie came out, uh, Jane and I watched it. We haven't watched the movie in probably six months, actually, but it was interesting because it basically. Um, well, one of the things I thought was the reason I wanted to watch it after reading the book is that I learned that the movie was actually the executive producers were the Obamas and it predicts, not predicts, but it, a, it, the movie is basically about 
collapse in the U.S. driven by first a, an attack on the electrical grid. And then that leads to social disorder and chaos and ultimately to a civil war. And it's, it's definitely shows how easy it would be to make it happen. Yeah, I can't wait to watch that movie. And when you mentioned that to when we were talking the other day, and you did mention that, what I especially shocking was not that the movie would be made, but the, the Obamas had something to do with that. What's going on with that? Yeah, and there were specific, there's big differences between the book and the movie. The movie is much more explicit about what's happening. There's some, you know, racial undertone in it. And um, apparently the, uh, the guy who wrote the book, who also adapted it for the film, uh, said that Barack himself was extremely involved in the, the changes in the rewriting of it because he wanted it to be realistic in his mind. And of course, you got to imagine that the, the next president probably has a different view of what's realistic than the average person would. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, whoever the next president uh, may or not be. But it is interesting that, uh, you know, Barry Sotaro or whatever his name is, uh, came from absolutely nowhere to being worth, I don't know, the numbers are bandied around $100 million or something like that now. More than enough. More, more than, than enough. More than enough. That and his connections and so forth. I mean, he can do a, he can do a lot of damage, and he is. Yes. And, and Michelle, just like Hillary, with, with the Billerys, uh, Hillary was much more vicious and dangerous than Bill. I think that uh, uh, Michelle is much more vicious and dangerous than uh, the Barry is. Certainly gets that impression. What do you think, how to, to answer this guy's question, I guess, how do you imagine that the combination of uh, guerrilla warfare and nanotech, how do, you, how do you imagine that would affect the, the land, the risk landscape, as he says, for typical people, like non-combatants in an environment in the U.S. in particular? Well, I think the way war has evolved, and it's funny, maybe war started out with, uh, in, in uh, Neolithic times, when one group attacked another group, everybody was involved in the war. I mean, you couldn't run and hide because it was, you know, your tribe against their tribe. And it was genocide, essentially, you know, an old human tradition, genocide. And then... As time went on, it was armies that did the fighting. And if you could stay out of the way of the army, uh, uh, you might be able to skate. But now it seems like we're going back to the way things were earlier. Uh, and, you know, it's this thing with the, uh, with the Muslims. Uh, the, uh, they take their religion much more seriously than Christians do. And... Uh, I wonder if it's not going to be a, a restart of the old war between Christianity and Mohammedanism, which, mm. you know, has actually been going on since I think the year was 632 when Mohammed died and uh, his followers took the show on the road and conquered pretty much the whole world in the next hundred years. And there have been some ups and downs where the uh, Christians held them off uh, the battle of tour in France and then kicked them out in Spain with, in the mid or the late, uh, 1400s. And then the battle of Vienna, you know, where they attacked from that side and almost conquered Europe coming from that side. And, you know, then they reverted to being, you know, backward primitive countries for the next few hundred years. And perhaps they'll have a resurgence now powered by, uh, oil, which is, you know, all that oil, basically under the prophet's lands. And these, pe these people, you know, believe this fanatical religion. And I'm actually quite anti-Islam because it's, uh, well, I'm, I'm not pro any religion that I can think of, quite frankly. But uh, Islam wants to uh, basically control the whole world, not just your mind, but they want to control the politics and and everything. That's what the Quran's all about. And some of these people, a lot of these people, you know, uh, really take it seriously. So uh, maybe we're going to have a restart of the war of what's left of the West. Not much, I'm afraid, at this point uh, with Islam. And uh, it doesn't look good for the West, I think. I think, I think it, regardless if it's driven by Islam or something else, 
there could likely be in the future, or maybe we're already starting to see it, that there is no such thing as a non-combatant. No, I don't think so. In a, in a religious war, there definitely isn't because, you know, you're offered, you know, you can convert uh, or, or you can be killed on the spot or, or maybe become a demi, a, a genuine second-class citizen. Mm. Do what you're told by text. And so, uh, you know, that could be what people in the West are confronted with in the future. Mm. Okay. Next uh, question. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a, listen, nobody's got a crystal ball. These are just some miscellaneous disturbing thoughts is all they are. But I think if you look at a situation where you have a collapse of some kind or, you know, uh, even just with the rise of crime and disorder in the U.S., I mean, those are the, the battle lines of who does, who is responsible for maintaining order and peace or whatever are, are being um, washed away, you know, where um, you just have to be, you have to, you can't walk, walk around assuming that you don't have to take responsibility for your own safety and well being anymore. Yeah, except increasing the state doesn't want you to take responsibility for your own well being and safety. If you defend yourself, chances are, better that you're going to be the one that's tried and fired and goes to prison as opposed to the perpetrator. 100%. I think that's on purpose. It's to create more disorder. I think that's the reason for it. So I think so too, actually. Okay. So next question, uh, Doug, you've talked a lot about wealth, venture, and philosophy. Uh, maybe you'd be willing to share some thoughts or ideas on living well, perhaps, uh, even how that has evolved over time for you. And he gives a little context about it, but how would you answer that? What do you think? Living well. Living well. Well, um, look, more is better. Having lots of stuff is better than not having lots of stuff. It can be convenient and comfortable. But uh, uh, I've found, like, when, you know, when I was a kid and in high school, college, after I got out of college for, for some, some years, at least five, I didn't have anything. I mean, I really didn't. I mean, I had some clothes and a car and a few things, and I was just really quite happy. I mean, I wanted more. Everybody wants more, but I didn't need any more to be perfectly happy. So, oh, and now oh, that I've got a lot of stuff, I don't really care about it. I mean, I really want to adopt the attitude of a Taoist monk where, you know, you have all this stuff, but you're not attached to it. I, I really try not to be attached to stuff. And the only thing that I think is really important, since everything, as a, uh, as a solipsist, who, or let's say someone with solipsist uh, tendencies, I think everything is in a way a figment of your own imagination. So you got to put your own imagination and your own mind in the right place. And what I've found I've made mistakes in the past, and they made me unhappy when I made the mistakes, and then I tried to correct the mistakes. That's what you try to do. And uh, the key, the key is to live an ethical life and do the right thing. If you don't do the right thing, that you think, oh, this is a mistake, I'm betraying somebody, I'm cheating or stealing or whatever, pick the advice. Uh, you know, uh, it, comes, it always comes back to haunt you. Maybe not in the real world, although probably, but certainly in your own mind. So that's the key. It's not having stuff like I was just talking about. That's not important. It's uh, your own psychology, and you control that by conducting yourself in an ethical way, which is, of course, one of the huge problems of, of going to school, uh, current school system, is that that is never, ever addressed, ethics. Uh, and doing the right thing and confronting that uh, type of thing. Never. It's just not addressed. In fact, in the meantime, kids have all kinds of total crap shoved down their throats, and they tend to believe that Marxist philosophies and so forth, which pass for ethics in their own way. So, I think it's even, I think that the one pervading philosophy around ethics, I think, that does exist beneath the surface of even that those, uh, those ideological views like Marxism is actually utilitarianism. It's like if it works, like if it gets you what you want in the world, like it gets you stuff if you come out ahead. I think a lot of the Marxist stuff, for instance, is just a way to get power from people 
you know, covertly who have something you want, you know, it's, it's, to, it's to upset that order as much as anything else. And so I think this, there's a, there's a utilitarianism that a lot of people have where they just feel like, you know, Hey, it worked. I got ahead, you know, it's okay. Like, and, and that, that's the measure of success. That's the measure of a good, whether or not you ended up materially better from a transaction. Yeah. And I'd also include Mohammedanism, better known today as Islam in that, because it's got really simple dictates that, you know, if you, uh, pull the five pillars, you'll be righteous. And, you know, you'll go to heaven and wonderful things will happen with the 72 versions and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, but you know, that's, um, so that's why people like it. I mean, it guarantees them something. It makes them part of the group. And it's only five things you got to remember, which are basically bullshit things. So it's, uh, corrupt and evil from, in my opinion, uh, uh, same thing as Marxism, all these, you know. So where does one, where does one find, uh, the study? Where should, where should somebody study ethics? Where should, how should they, what, what kind of framework should they use for that? If it's not available to them now, they don't know. I'm, um, I'm kind of partial to, um, I'm partial to Taoism as, uh, as an attitude towards life, but, uh, I'm also very partial to, uh, stoicism and stoicism has kind of a bad rap, um, in the West, because if you're a stoic, it means you're, you absorb bad things and, you know, you, you're stoic, you know, Yeah. but that's actually an incorrect, you know, that's an incorrect reading of, of what that whole philosophy is about. So, uh, I'll tell you what would be is simple and easy and is really, really a good read. I haven't read it for decades and I've really got to reread it again. It's Marcus Aurelius's meditations. I mean, it's, that, that is really a work of genius. And, you know, he was kind of the last stoic philosopher and before him was Cicero and before him was Epictetus and they all have observations on what's right and what's wrong and what you should do and you shouldn't do. And they're very wise. But I, uh, I think the best summarized by uh, Marcus Aurelius. So, uh, and uh, I think it's the most accessible. Yeah. Most accessible. <clears throat> and I'm sure you can download that book on the, uh, on the internet. And, and, and here's something funny. We're talking about Bill Clinton. Bill, Bill says that's his favorite book, mm. which. Just goes to story. <laughs> you read you read the book and say it's your favorite book. It may well be. I don't doubt that. I don't think he's lying about that. Although he's capable of lying about er anything and everything. But you know, does it have an effect on him? Not not much. Okay. Word off. I'll, let me grab a copy of it because I actually uh, there's this translation I like. I want to share it real quick. Yeah, I've read like four or five different translations of it, and this is the one that I found to be the best. Right. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, translations are so important. They're so important. I mean, I read the uh, Koran a couple of years ago, actually. And, uh, you know, I, I had to agree with H.L. Mencken when he said that it's basically the sounds of a dog down on all four, down on all fours barking. I mean, that was, that was his opinion of the Koran. But maybe I didn't read the right translation. Or they say you have to read it in the original Arabic to really understand it. Well, I think that's more trouble than it's worth based on the translation that I read, which may not have been the best. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Um, he says, I see things moving in a positive direction. The first turning, uh, the first turning or America's last high ended when Kennedy was assassinated. Will the fourth turning end when America brings the CIA and DC swamp to justice for his murder? I can see a narrow path where Americans collectively realize the state is the problem. This feels like this is an issue that must be dealt with. Well, I certainly agree. The state is a problem in the here and our world. I mean, I mean, it's like an extremely dangerous predator that's hunting us all, but, um, and that's not really what the fourth turning is about. I mean, that book, uh, Strauss and Howe first wrote a book called Generations, where they laid out their theory. And then they wrote 
then they wrote, wrote the book, the fourth, was it the fourth turning? The second yeah. book they wrote. It yeah. might've been millennials or, well, the fourth turning was the next one, I think. I think so. Yeah. And I think they have a third book out or how does Strauss is dead now. Yeah. It's called the fourth turning is here and it's not, it's not worth reading. I mean, I think, I think how might've carried more water than I assumed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so anyway, uh, the idea, it's a cyclical theory of history. Everybody knows that, or thinks they know who's, you know, right to left, whatever that is, liberal to conservative back and forth. Kids react against their parents and then they back, back and forth. So they came up with, what I thought was, and I think is an original and unique idea that it's actually four things. Uh, and it lasts over a, roughly a hundred years, each generation being 20 to 25 years. And um, it's predictable because everybody that's born and grows up in a certain era, you know, share a lot of values and a lot of thoughts and a lot of perceptions and, you know, they've eaten the same intellectual food at school and, you know, tend to react the same way and so forth. So that's what that's about. And I think he's right. I, th- I think it's generally right. And the way they, they see it is that they, uh, we're in a fourth turning right now, and there's no guarantee that anything is going to happen. All of the fourth turnings, is that there's going to be a really big upset, like world war, economic depression, nasty things happen. And who sorts it and how it sorts out? Do the good guys win or the bad guys win? Nope, they don't make any prediction about that. Oh, no. But when you, I, I reread that book um, at the start of COVID and it had a different effect on me than it did the first time I read it, which I think was in the mid 2000s. And um, it basically says that it's a, you could expect a creation of a new world order. I mean, the whole new world order was created the last hundred years ago that, you know, that we've been living in and that that whole thing is up for grabs. And so assumptions about the state, you know, about justice being you know, uh, administered to right some wrongs of the past, like Kennedy's assassination, something like that. It just seems so uh, uncertain and unlikely, even that in that resettling of the whole new world order, that that would come. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, I mean, the only thing that they really uh, predict is that it's going to be very upsetting. <laughs> but nobody knows. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Next question. Has Doug ever considered the implications of registr- registration and certificates of birth? This is access to education, health, credit, travel, driving, formal employment, and more all depend on this one document as do taxes. Can Doug imagine a future where people may choose not to register their children at birth, especially if more of these services are performed at a local or community level by private companies, not to mention a decent living can be earned without requiring a bank account. Could being stateless be an advantage in the future? Uh, that's actually a very, very good question because I mean, uh, this whole thing of formal birth certificates, certificates is relatively recent, uh, phenomenon. I mean, before that people used to write birth of their kid in the family Bible, uh, and that was accepted by whoever was being proof of who you were because Things were not terribly well organized a uh, hundred years ago, certainly. And um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, and this brings up the question about let's suppose you're um, you live in northern Minnesota and kids born. Well, maybe you could also walk across the border and walk into a Canadian hospital and have a birth certificate filled out for both Canada and the U.S. Now, the kid is actually two separate people, if you want. I mean, Mm -hmm. things like that could be done, and you can play that out further if you want. Uh, During the 60s, or was it the 70s, um, an old friend of mine, and he was a friend of mine, named Barry Reed, wrote a book called The Paper Trip, uh, which was a guidebook to how to uh, create numerous extra identities for yourself. And he explained how you do this by, you know, well, 
you uh, find somebody that's died uh, who would be about the same age that you would be and do a little bit of research, or you go to Skid Row and you pay, pay, pay the crumb bum a hundred bucks to come up with his birth certificate. You know, he's a non-person. He's, there's all kinds of ways of, now with the computer system and, and, and facial recognition and fingerprinting and all this stuff now, the old paper trip isn't what it used to be. In fact, Barry, it's, it's kind of sad because Barry's, I think, I think Barry's still alive. I haven't talked to him for years. I think he, he lived in Fountain Valley, California. And uh, he did a three-year stretch because he was running pot and made a lot of money, but he got caught. And then after he wrote the paper trip, which became kind of a phenomenon on how to set a second identity or several, uh, the state really wanted to get him. And kind of foolishly, uh, Barry gave him an entree in that uh, he set up a business to uh, where you could buy something that looked just like the driver's license of every state. But it wasn't, obviously, it wasn't. But it didn't represent that. It, it just looked a lot like it. So that maybe it didn't say driver's license on it because if it looked enough like it, it was kind of clever, but maybe not so clever. And he had to do another three-year stretch for, you know, violating those laws, all this type of thing. So anyway, this whole idea is that the question you're asked about is, it's not a new one, but it's a very interesting one. Yeah, I guess now there's a whole set of laws that you probably call identity theft, you know, to do that at all. Yeah, I'm sure they'll find a, a hundred ways from Sunday to, uh, to throw, to put you in jail and throw away the key. Because you do that kind of a crime, it's not just like killing somebody or, or robbing somebody. You're showing yourself to be an enemy of the state, and that's a really serious crime. Right. To be an enemy of your fellow man isn't really that bad. But if you're an enemy of the state, they're going to that's, that's right. Hey, let's get our priorities in order here, you know? State comes first. Exactly. Um, all right. Uh, Doug, talking heads say the Fed is going to lower rates. Uh, he says it. It looks like they will actually raise rates. What do you think? I don't pay attention to these fools. I mean, how many economists are employed by the Federal Reserve? I looked it up one time. What's the number 10,000? I don't know. It was some large number of PhD economists that are little bed bugs in their cubicles at, at the Eccles building and other uh, places where they hang out. And they don't know what's going on. They're operating on the wrong theories, the wrong premises, the whole thing. And, and then Powell, you know, says uh, rates have to go up because we've got to get inflation under control. Well, they shouldn't have the right or ability to control rates to start with. And then, well, maybe we can lower them because we need to stimulate the... This is all, this is all insanity and craziness. And when you're dealing with misinformed, marginally seeing people. I mean, I don't care what they say. It's a, I guess it's, you know, assuming he's not lying about something. Oh, uh, yeah, I just, I don't pay any attention to it. Exactly. I really don't. I mean, you got better things to do than hear what, what some stupid bureaucrat is saying and probably lying when he says it. It, pro it shows how perverted the system is, though, that there are so many Fed watchers and that the Fed's moves are going to change the markets in this one way or another. Yeah. You know, I've asked Fed watchers, people that their lives seem to revolve around what one Fed guy or another says. And I asked one of them one time, it was kind of well known. I says, well, do you know who was the Fed guy at the time? Was it Bernanke? I don't know. So he says, well, Bernanke thinks this and Bernanke will do this. And I explained Bernanke, blah, 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 blah. So I asked him, I says, do you know Bernanke? He said, no. I said, you ever met him? He said, no. Well, he didn't know anything. All he knew was what he read in the paper or, or what the guy said, <laughs> which is, he's a proven liar. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Okay. Do you believe in the 12,500-year uh, pole shift phenomenon? Well, if, you know, science 
assuming we can trust science, which is becoming less trustworthy <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. There's all kinds of cyclical phenomena in the Europe universe. I mean, the earth revolves around the Milky Way, which is spinning, and that has an effect going through different parts of, of the universe, because we're talking a galaxy, the next step up is the universe. Yeah, that has an effect and, and the sun revolving, uh, the earth revolving around the sun and has elliptical, semi-elliptical orbit. And you know, they, these things are all cyclical. I mean, and they go on for millions of years and, and pull a shift. Okay. That's one of the things that, uh, it's, it's been shown poles shift every, I don't even know how many, I don't care. You want to know why I don't care? It's because if the poles shift, the only effect it will have is on electronics. It's not going to have any effect that I know of or read about. Maybe a basic thing. Perhaps mm -hmm. I, uh, the poles shift doesn't mean the earth sure turns upside down. It's just the magnetic field changes. Well, yeah, maybe that, uh, maybe as it changes, the cosmic rays can't be blocked fully by the mag magnetos around the earth and so forth. If the poles shifted, I suppose it would be very damaging where positive turns to negative all of a sudden to satellites and electronic communications and all this type of thing. Mm -hmm. and I don't know that much about it, quite frankly. But, you know, should you worry about it? No. Well, I think I've, I've seen a, I've seen a pretty cataclysmic take on it. That is, yeah, that basically because of the, it has an effect on the, uh, the oceans essentially, because essentially it causes a change in spin of some kind temporarily that movement does. And so it causes gigantic tsunamis among other, I'm not an expert on it, but this is why I remember this, but totally cataclysmic as it said. Oh, because I thought the pole shift would just be a, an electronic phenomenon, really. That's what I, I remember reading that a long time ago as well. And then I've, like I said, I've seen this take on it, but either way. It's not something you should worry about, primarily because there's nothing you can do about it. If it's cataclysmic, it won't matter. I mean, in the, in the most cataclysmic scenario I saw, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll soon. And in the... Well, you know, well, yeah, it's, well, this is, maybe I should research this a little bit and find out what people say about it and hope that I don't accidentally go down some rabbit hole that has to do with the, there's the hollow earth. There's one and the flat earth is another. So, yeah. but I'm sure pole shift is, 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 is real. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Let's see. Next question here is since the introduction of countries selling citizenships has gone somewhat mainstream as a commodity, does Doug think that there's an opportunity to broker swaps between them, which is to say aim to get two countries on board so that individuals can swap citizenship rights? Or is this an, a legal nightmare to even approach? The selling points of governments would uh, be the quality of citizenships over time, he says. Yeah. No, I don't think it'll work. No. Because one thing that the governments like to purvey is that your citizenship is valuable. It's holy, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the governments are never going to let you swap one for the other on any kind of a formal basis. It's, it's just not the way, that's just not the way they think. Right. Okay. No, it's a good idea, though. It'd be cool if you could. Oh, well, yeah, I suppose. And it is nice that citizenships have become kind of demythologized because you can buy them at this point, which is fine. It's just government ID is all it is. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Next question is about uh, David Webb and the Great Taking. He says, I know Webb says that there's no place in the world safe from the Great Taking and trying to stop it is the only solution. But are places like Uruguay safer than a place in the U.S. if this happened? I'd say no. What do you think, Matt? You, you actually delved into it much deeper than I have. I think that there's a couple of advantages to being in, a, in Uruguay in this regard than in the U.S. Um, because everything, because it's a much more developed and financialized economy in the U.S., so much... Every, so many things are securitized, whether they be mortgage, whether they be debts or assets. And if the, if that is upturned, 
the disorder on it would cause in society, it would be, it's just hard to even describe like how bad that could be, the, the outcomes of that. And in places like Uruguay, they don't have these developed, you know, consumer economies or even credit economy, really. And so I, yeah, people might lose. I mean, if the people who do own stocks and bonds, you know, if those are lost or your ownership is lost somehow in those things, the real assets really would still be here. That's a good point. Yeah, Uruguay wouldn't be damaged as badly because it's not as financialized, over-financialized as the U.S. is. Yeah, that's a good point. Uruguay is more real things. I got title to my ranch, I got title to my cows, and my building, stuff like that. Yeah, different from the U.S. where it's all in the ether, as it in were, the or the cloud, I guess I should say. Exactly. All right, Doug. So the next question is, outside of foreign powers drawing up countries on a map, does Doug believe some countries shouldn't exist? I'm writing you from the Caribbean, and while it, is, it has its use cases, it doesn't seem too sensible to reside here from a risk and economic point of view. The Europeans largely abandoned their territories back in the day. So why do people stay? Yeah, that's kind of two questions, really. Um, are these kind of tiny little microstates should they exist? Are they worth anything? And I'd say it's wonderful that countries like Dominica and Grenada and St. Kitts and there's a whole bunch of them uh, in the Caribbean. I think it's wonderful that they have the same vote in the United Nations for what it's worth. They mainly just sell their votes. I mean, that's, that's what they do, adding to the fact that it's a giant sham. So, yeah, I, look, when a thousand flowers bloom, there's 192 recognized states, I think, something like that in the world. I'd like to see 1,900 or 19,000 would be better. So, uh, yeah, they serve a useful purpose. Uh, the trouble is there's not enough of them rather than there's too many. Yeah, and the problem is, is that they all got their, their little, little shitty governments that make all kinds of rules with taxes and that, you know, make every, all the locals' lives miserable, you know politicians pretending they're big shots. And uh, that's the problem, not the fact that they're separate entities, but the fact that these governments actually think that they're, you know, they do all kinds of stupid things. They have regular. If there, more, if there are more, there'd be more competition and it would force them to govern better. Yes, that's exactly right. Exactly right. Or you just move out to the state on the next island. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the second part of the question, I guess, was, uh, you know, why do people stay in those places? Well, let me see. I like the Caribbean. I mean, uh, you can't get everything that you want. Nothing, everything works on island time, but the weather is usually pretty good, except when they have a hurricane. So why do people stay there? I mean, it's laid back. Uh, Highly desirable, some of those places. I mean, just like, you know, Cayman, for instance, right? Cayman, highly desirable. And I've never been to uh, St. Barth's, but it is supposed to be the, um, you know, the, uh, the Aspen of the Caribbean. The Aspen of the Caribbean, right. So yeah. I'll have to be there uh, sometime. George Gammon likes to hang out in, 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 the, in St. Barth's. I, I've always heard it's a fantastic place where all the rich people, super rich people go. No crime, you know, the food's great, everything, you know, works. There's a lot of money that flows in there. Yeah. So that's an exception. Okay. Next question. We just have a few others here. Uh, is Trump a national socialist? A national socialist. Well, of course. Hmm. Is he? Well, let's put it this way. Yes, I guess you'd have to say that because Trump is a fascist, somebody that believes in the integration of the state with corporations and the economy. Uh, fascism is a word, most people are unaware of this, that was uh, coined by Mussolini, who, you know, formed an overtly fascist state. And then Hitler was a fascist with extreme nationalist um, overtones. So, uh, and he was a national socialist. The Nazi party uh, is it's an abbreviation of, in German, uh, what's the German correctly? National socialist. That's what Nazi is, is a contraction of. So, uh, but you know, Trump doesn't want to eradicate the Jews. I mean, that's, 
<laughs> that's not one of his things. So, uh, look, all these politicians are, are nationalists. Most of them are, and they're all, they're all socialists of some shade, some variety. So, uh, yeah, I, I suppose so. It's important to define these words and discuss. So before we answer the question, is Trump a national socialist? I think we ought to find out exactly what Trump feels about a whole bunch of subjects. And then we can see you know, to what degree he's checked the boxes. It is laid out by Mussolini or is laid out by, by Hitler or maybe is laid out by Peron in Argentina, who was a big fan of Mussolini's and kind of a fan of Hitler's. I mean, so what kind of national socialism you want? It's, it's kind of a floating abstraction, really. Yeah, you, you pointed out before that uh, Trump kind of lacks any ideological core, though, any philosophical core, I think you said. Yeah. So maybe yeah. he's just kind of like a mishmash of different things that he thinks will work. Maybe utilitarian. He's a utilitarian, an opportunist. He's cap I think Trump is capable of doing anything that seems like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay. Oh, well, thank God! Thank God, he's a cultural conservative. I mean, that's one thing he's got going. And you know, since he's a business guy, he kind of reacts against regulations he doesn't like. Okay, that's that's. Yeah, I and mean, by being a business guy, he has uh, a relationship with reality that somebody like uh, the Obamas wouldn't, for instance. No, they have no relationship with reality. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Uh, how do you proportion the amount of money you actually deploy in the markets versus cash sitting on the sidelines for good speculations? Are you, are you mainly liquid right now waiting for a buying opportunity? I am not a um, financial planner. In other words, I don't, you know, financial planners, I think they can get you in a lot of trouble, actually. You know, they were the ones that said, well, when you're young, you want to be what, 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds, and you get older, 60% in bonds and 40% in stocks. And this is prudent financial planning. And of course, as interest rates have recently proved, that can be a total disaster. Better, than, worse than no plan at all, as it turns out. So, um, no, I just look for opportunities. And, you know, I don't like to get over leverage. I, I really don't like to use margin. I mean, I really don't. That's how you can get in trouble. And lose more than you have, which is bad. Maybe it's really bad. <laughs> so, other than that, I listen. I just try to be reasonably prudent. Although I ask myself all the time, you know, I've always been uh, inclined towards natural resources. Now there are a number of reasons why I can justify having always been inclined towards national res natural resources, but. Right now, being as intellectually honest as I can possibly be, I think they're about the best place, maybe the only place to be right now. So I'm really overweight towards them, which is considered to be prudent, but I don't know what else to do. Yeah, and you, know, and you always have cash on the sidelines so that you can you don't have to worry about the price fluctuations of those things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You have, you have some of the, sure, the dollar is losing value at 10% per year, and maybe the bank or institution, I keep the dollars, it'll disappear, and I'll lose all the dollars. And it's all kinds of bad things that can happen, no matter what you do. It's, the world is not a stable place today, unfortunately. Yeah. And I, th I think the most, for me, you know, I'm not a, I don't approach any of that in, in maybe as analytical way as I should and say like, you know, 15% cash and like, I don't do that, but there's a, there's certain changes by the year, but what I need to sleep comfortably at night is basically kind of the guideline I use. And that changes based upon circumstances, but you know, never, never I've been in positions before where I was too invested, where I did not sleep well at night or I had you know, I was leveraged in gold futures at one point and I did definitely did not sleep well. There was like a few weeks where I didn't sleep at all because of that. So, um, just avoiding that, I think has been, has worked well for me. Yeah. And it should build more assets, uh, assuming that, uh, David went isn't too correct, too correct, too soon with the, the great taking. You know, I like to own stocks that are 
that pay big dividends, but not because they're about to cut the dividend, uh, but because high dividends can be an outward sign of inward grace. Uh, nobody wants, you know, everybody hates these things. So the stock itself is depressed, even though it's a business to be in. Anyway, yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't use any conventional, I don't, you know, not to make any comparisons with Warren Buffett. I don't think Warren Buffett ever used that 60 40 thing for Berkshire. Berkshire, no. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Okay. Uh, just two more questions for you, Doug. Um, number one is uh, on gold. Uh, Doug says it's fairly valued. How do you reason or calculate that to get to that conclusion? Well, okay. You got to look at not just gold, but everything relative to everything else to see what might be an anomaly at the time of spiked for some reason. So, all right, I started buying gold at roughly $42 an ounce or something like that uh, back in the early 70s, not quite 1971 when it was still 35. And so it's gone upwards in price about 50 times since then. Has the general price level gone up 50 times since 1971? No, I don't think it has. It's probably gone up about 10 times since then. But gold had been artificially suppressed by the U.S. government for 40 years, from 1933 to 1971. So it had a lot of catching up to do. Yes, the government was, you know, on a lot of gold, could keep the price where they wanted to. So that considered, I think relative to the price of a car or a suit or a meal and whatever kind of restaurants you want to look at, I think gold at 2000 is, yeah, about right. I mean, you could say, yeah, it's about right anywhere in between 1500 and 2000 for that matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's because, you know, developments in technology make some things cheaper and, and other things make them more expensive. It's, it's a uh, seat of the pants and people, people do, you know, they crunch numbers and, and the ones that I've looked at say, yeah, gold's about right right now. But that said, I'm a bull because the world is right now on the ra razor's edge catastrophe. And if it goes off the wrong edge of the razor's edge, uh, gold's going to be real cheap. And there's arguments I can make that gold is real cheap to redeem all the dollars outside the U.S. and inside. There's all kinds of things that I've written about in the past. The answer to the question is, yeah, that's about right right now. I mean, it's not like a super speculation because it's underpriced. And, and this bullshit about, you know, they, whoever they are, are suppressing the price of gold. I've never seen any evidence of that at all. I mean, that's just, you know. Okay. All right. Last question. This asks, uh, you know, what are your top countries for young families to set up a new life? Have you observed this anywhere where you think it's good, where you think there's the most opportunity? And I know this highly depends upon the person. Like if you are, if you have a job that can be done online, it changes it dramatically. If you have to get local employment, you know, the economics really affect it. But obviously language and culture issues are there. But have you seen places where people tend to thrive? Do you have any ideas? I think if um, you can, um, if you work manipulating digits uh, and you can work by yourself, actually one of those little Caribbean islands, you could do worse than that. I think you could do worse. But if, uh, if it, you don't have capital and you've got to, you know, work to uh, not the best place then. So what do you come down to? The U.S. is still one of the best places, maybe the best place in the world. If you don't have any capital to earn capital and put it together, probably still the best place or Canada or Australia or New Zealand. Uh, you know, certainly if you're English speaking, does so that helps? You, got, you know, if you're going to work in the society, if you don't have money, you really have to speak the language quite frankly. Oh, uh, so those are the big four. Yeah, if you're trying, if you need capital, if you're trying to generate capital, if you already have capital, how how does that? What would you say? Or if you can manipulate digits online for income? 
Yeah, where would I go then? Well, yeah. I really like I really like Southeast Asia. Always have. And I think Thailand is the neatest place in Southeast Asia because it's always been independent. Yeah, it's, it really is different from, I think, all of us countries are different from each other. But that's a place that's worth looking at, quite frankly. Uh, where else would I go? Listen, when we were in Palau, there was this one guy who was the, who was the president's best buddy, who was an American, and he wound up in Palau because I think his, I think his boat basically crashed there. Exactly. And it's like a Jeff Berwick story. You know, he was sailing and it, it just, that's, that's a place where it broke down. Yeah, pretty much. And he was doing well and he was happy. Oh, uh, and actually that's a nice place to be. Yeah. Also, no, I can't think of any, listen, oh, well, there's a friend of ours named Sven Lorenz. He, he writes a uh, quite an interesting, uh, uh, newsletter actually quite interesting. Undervalued uh, shares, I think is what it's called. Undervalued shares. And it's a, and, a, and it's a super bargain. I think he charges like $50 for a year for it, which is way, way too cheap for the amount of research he does. But, uh, he, uh, he spends a lot of time on, is it Sark? Yes. Yes. This is a channel Island, small channel Island, very small. It has no airport and it's kind of inconvenient, but, uh, few people Lots of legal benefits because of its unique Channel Island status. I mean, there are places like that out there. I mean, there really are. I... Yeah, that's an interesting one. People should look into that more because what he's doing there is pretty cool. I mean, he's and he's in with the. It's definitely a locally run. You know, they have a lot of local privilege, I guess. Yeah, over their own legal matters. So yeah, that's an interesting place. I also think. I mean. Uh, you know, Nick Giambruno is in, he has a young family and he's in Argentina and, you know, the cost of living there is cheap and he's in an area that's out of the way of any disorder that might be there. And he can take advantage if Argentina does turn around and, uh, he can earn income online. So like, if, and, and I think about the one thing about for a young family, which is what the guys, he asked about families, I think in Latin America, families are still valued in a way that, that they aren't in the U S where families yes. are a big deal. So if you want to kind of instill those values where it's not bad to have kids around, you know, where people aren't looked at like a nuisance or having kids is destroying Mother Earth or something like that, then Latin America in general is going to be better. No. Yeah, just just stay out of places that that uh where where crazy things happen all the time. So you know, I mean, I've I've recommended for years that if you're a young male looking to make his fortune. Yeah, I think Africa, including weird places in Africa, like Central Africa, are, yeah, they're really worthwhile for lots of reasons. But um, uh, no, I'm pretty much, there's, there's no, no shame. Okay. I'm just, no, we're all looking for that Shangri-La, that, you know, like um, the Cayman Islands. I mean, when I first went to the Cayman Islands, it was, you know, just a really backward, quiet, peaceful, nice little Caribbean island. And in the last 50 years, I mean, it's ultra prosperous, rich, changed a lot, but still very stable. I mean, small enough that they all know each other. And that helps. I th listen, the best thing you can do is to, um, while it's still possible to travel, and it's becoming less and less possible all the time, slowly, slowly, but it's happening less possible, I would uh, try to see the world. Got to get out there and experience it. No doubt about it. Okay. Well, that's good. Thanks. Thanks for taking another weekend day to do this, Doug. I appreciate it. I'm sure our viewers do too. And we'll be back next week with more. Yes. I look forward to it. I'll be, uh, I'll be in Uruguay next week. So, Awesome. Good. We'll see you there. Thanks, man.